we're live. Hi, Maureen. How are you? I am well. Thank you very much. It's uh, difficult times, as everyone yes. knows, but absolutely, I, uh, I have embraced some of the opportunity the difficulty has given me, and uh, I'm also very well because I'm very glad I see the end of the tunnel. <laughs> so the change that's uh, coming ahead is also something I'm very much looking forward to. That's good. Things are opening up again, including your business, which is really nice. Yes, yes, we've um, we've had in the last twelve weeks had major transitions to yes. make, um, going into how we practice business and then making that work, and then just about the time you get your wheels under you, it's change again. Yes, absolutely, and you've you've had to pivot a few times. And so Donna, um, you know, I'll have a little bit of your bio in the show notes, but can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and, and maybe even how I know you? I, I love that um, question in a sense. I don't often still look back at myself in this way, but I am the executive director, the clinical director, and I maintain an active uh, full clinical practice within the um, umbrella the corporate name of Inner Solutions. I have been in that role from the inception, and when I think of inception, Inner Solutions was um, incorporated in 2003, so mm -hmm. we're marking 17 years, but it was in fact an extension of my private practice. And that private practice had been in play for about, 10 years before Inner Solutions ever became a corporate entity. Okay, private practice as what? So I'm a registered psychiatric nurse and we're pretty much becoming, uh, I would like to say a bit obsolete because our profession actually practiced as uh, staff in mental hospitals. But over the decades, um, Psychiatric nurses have been given the incredible opportunity to understand mental illness as an illness from the medical model and to practice being treatment providers using the psychosocial models that are right. available now. So as a clinician, that's my profession and my practice is really moved from working in the hospital systems, outpatient programs, into providing that individual psychotherapy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the broken open question, Donna, are you ready for this? Let's start off with this and we'll, we'll try it out. So can you, can you tell me about a time when you experienced some adversity that at the time felt like crisis, felt like the end of the world that in hindsight was a gift you phrased that so well <laughs> i remember it several very vividly but when i think about uh, the one that probably was most dire for me was um, a time when i was in a comfortable job i had an assured paycheck and I was going through a place of restlessness. And at the same time, my personal life started to swagger. And I was looking for the future. Where would I go? Knowing that if I didn't make some changes, I would become despondent. I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't have the passion for what I believe was so inherent in my work. So I... Took an, an took an opportunity that wasn't very socially sanctioned. My mm -hmm. colleagues, um, when they heard about an opportunity, definitely didn't even occur to them that I might extend myself to say, hey, I want to apply for that position. Mm -hmm. And so it was a unconventional move for a psychiatric nurse. What I was doing is leaving um, sort of the structured role I might have had to taking on uh, working within a team where I would learn cognitive behavioral therapy and I didn't have anybody 
within my team, much less my profession that was doing that. Mm. Uh, it was all something I could do. The door was open and I took that initiative and people were silent in that. Um, I told my friend, different friends about it, one who actually had been trained as a psych nurse in the past. And she just said, how on earth, are, what happens? How, how can you imagine doing that? What happens if it falls apart? Mm. What happens if you get there and um, you find out that the door closes behind you? Mm. Those are really worrisome questions. And I recall thinking about it. And in that case, I thought if the opportunity is there, then it's acceptable and permission is given. I can go there. So I decided I would go and partly because I had thought about what would happen if I didn't. And it occurred to me that I was terrified to think where I would be in a year or two or three if I didn't take the initiative. Mm, isn't that something? That is a huge part. So I was restless and alarmed about where I was at, but I was also alarmed about going forward. There was no certainty. Mm -hmm. What I did know for certain was both options were going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And I remember evaluating that in my heart, best case scenario, three to five years from now, which one would leave me potentially most enthused. And so I took that initiative and lo and behold, I got where I got into the position. I and I found out that as much as I'd been given the position, it was all within the process. The colleagues and the director at the time actually didn't want me there. Mm. And it wasn't because of my credentials. There were other political pieces going on at the time. Wow. And it was my first experience being socially ostracized and formally shunned. Oof. And that was, those are not words I use very, very lightly. I, no. I've defined them, redefined them, explored them in every context. And that was a difficult, difficult time for me. And I simply kept asking, what do I do? What can I participate in? And I was told, uh, figure it out. Oh. I was told, figure it out. Um, I can give some brutal examples that are, that are very, very hard to think anybody would actually go through this. And then I think about the fact I didn't know how long that was going to endure. Right. And that's the part I find a little bit mysterious to me. I didn't know if the situation was going to be forever. I do know that within that time, somebody uh, who worked there, who was one arm's length removed from the program, um, had no investment in the dynamic on the team, really. And she befriended me. Mm. I essentially had nothing to do. They wouldn't give me any work. Mm -hmm. And so I simply read, did other busy work, learning. I took some courses. And she said, why don't we go for coffee? And I said, oh, my goodness, I'm at work. I can't do that. She said, oh, heck, they won't even miss you. They don't even know you're here. <laughs> anyway, that, she was helpful to me. And I really attribute a whole lot of getting through that time. Um, to her and it was through her I found out the time frame that I was going to be expected to endure. I had no other information other than a bit of insider knowledge and in fact it was about six months mm -hmm. that I lived it with the ambiguity and she said uh, I can't tell you when but when it ends it'll surprise everybody mm. and, it, and it did because it was a messy political situation and when it resolved um, it was good. I was there. And then I had opportunities that the others then had to adjust to. Wow. So it sounds like you, you know, here you were, things were not going well. The future was looking a little 
like it was looking difficult, as you said, in the job that you had, in the role that you had. You didn't have a ton of support or advocacy from your colleagues or anywhere, really. You, you decided to take a risk, you know, knowing that it would be, there would be hard times in, in that, in that risk too. And then you land and you're lonely. You're lonely and you're, uh, you're held <clears throat> out. You're almost, it, I mean, you, you mentioned ostracized and, you know, almost, I think of bullying in the workplace, you know, I hate to use the word bullying because it gets overused, but I think of that, like it sounds bullying-ish. Yeah. And then, um, and, and what really struck me is when you said that you didn't know how long it would last. And mm -hmm. isn't that the way it goes? When we are in a feeling of, you know, the world is ending, it does sort of feel like it's, it's this is it. This is it. Everything's awful and it's never going to be better. Um, now you, 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 you did get through that. We now know, and I'm sure that you teach a lot, this, mm -hmm. this too shall pass. And so when you look back on that, what were the gifts? I think the gifts was I had a sense of fact-based knowing. I knew the facts were that I this wasn't personal to me. Got it. I knew I had a right to be there. I wasn't doing anything that hadn't been actually endorsed at some level. So I knew that I could be there. Mm -hmm. And and I couldn't go back, which is another thing. So I knew it's going forward from here. And I had this intense sense that I was going to do something with my time. So they didn't give me work and they shunned me. The group shunned me. I mean, someone came into the office, someone I had a fond heart for, I knew her in a different context. She came in and shut the door in my office and I thought, oh, this is nice. You're gonna have I'm gonna have a chat. And she, I'll, I'll just say that in the sense of being ostracized and shunned, she said, I need you to know I'm just the messenger. Oh. And she said, um, we're having a Christmas party as you probably suspected and I'm here to suggest you don't come. Oh, Donna. And I felt for her, believe it or not, because I really did like her. Uh, in many other ways, but I thought she's right. She's the messenger. Don't go. Anyway, um, I went. For you. Well, For I you. went, and I thought, what the heck is that about? Because um, now you've made me mad. You've you're, you've you've now you provoked the bear. Yeah. Anyway, it was it was all very very interesting and. It, now it serves to endorse that if you just trust your knowing and if you let yourself get a little bit feisty about things, you know, I, w I wasn't the one being dis in this dysfunction. I was just unwanted. So at any rate, <laughs> yeah, that, that was very, very good. But this idea that it would end eventually, I decided I didn't know when, but it occurred to me that there was, I hadn't had much opportunity in the years before that to do nothing but read, take courses and educate myself. And I could go to work. My, ch my children were all in school and occupied and I could go to work and study. Yeah. And I did that for um, that about four months. And that's, I found, that's great. I, and I went outside to, you know, have coffee with someone who was very uh, supportive of, and I just started studying and reading anything that interested me. And uh, lo and behold, that's exactly what opened. It was the, it was the gateway to what I do now. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, and people might be surprised to learn that this is this kind of dynamic uh, because, you know, people think, well, that might go on in school or that kind of dynamic might occur in, <clears throat> you know, in some workplaces, but in the, in the counseling community, that kind of inhumanity. Mental health services in Calgary. Absolutely. Yeah. Craziness to use yeah. the word crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's wild. And so, and so it, it was a bit of a segue and, and a door opener for you, you know, and I, I, I want to, you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that segue but before I go there you know you study resiliency theory probably more than 
most people that I would talk to. <clears throat> so when you think about that time, you know, when you think about resiliency as some, like I, I always refer to it as a muscle that we build yeah, over time. It is. It is. Um, what were the components of that, the, that experience that helped you build resilience? I've often thought about that and it had occurred to me that I had plenty of experience uh, having to do things on my own. And I think about that as not just as a woman, but as an eldest child. Mm -hmm. And in the family unit I had, very uh, hardworking, both parents worked very, very hard in agriculture. And therefore, I always had a sense of being alone, not uh, neglected, just on my own, with a lot of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, it wasn't personalized to me, which I think is really important when it comes to getting through difficult things, that mm -hmm. the experience wasn't personalized to me or about me. But this being alone and being able to problem solve, to look at a variety of options, whether they're positive, negative, you know, there are essentially no certainty, but problems needing to be solved. And that being alone, not having any certainty that this problem is going to get solved by someone else. That's had been a great deal of my life for at least a decade before that. Event. Right. Right. And so you carried that through. It carries me today. This sense of aloneness. I don't experience it as aloneness. I experience it as um, raw autonomy mm -hmm. it's not just autonomy in a sense of liberation and lots of elbow room raw meaning okay i haven't got enough uh, i haven't got a warm enough coat on <laughs> there's a it's a heavy it's a very uh, sort of raw autonomy and that experience comes to me an awful lot that sense of not just being alone, but I'm on my own. Right. And this is on me. And where I go from here is really about which steps, which direction I go. Right. And you talked a little bit about tapping in and listening to yourself as well. And that, uh, that personal knowing of what's right and who you are and what you're about and what you stand for and just going for it. That coupled with the... and with the awareness of what happens if I don't move? Okay, yeah. What if I just stay? And, and that I believe is as important to be aware of as what the options may be going elsewhere. Yeah, for sure. If you, if you don't weigh where you're at now with what the alternatives are, I think you get overwhelmed and it's way too ambiguous. The one thing that isn't ambiguous is where you are now. Yeah. That's cool. So that opportunity took you into the business that you do now. Mm. It did because I ventured from having a uh, expected job, 40 hours a week, a paycheck um, that was predictable. And then I was no longer satisfied. I was restless. I felt okay, I've mastered this, I know this. The, the larger systems around me are often burdensome to me. Yes. And I think about, okay, what else do I want to do? And one day the opportunity came um, for me to have uh, my own opportunity to do case management counseling with supervision. But that branched over a matter of, well, maybe five years, when someone from the community asked if I would see them mm -hmm. in, in counseling, and I told them that I wasn't, it wasn't within the scope of my, my position. I couldn't just elect to do that. And they, and they said, no, I meant, can you just see me? Haven't you got an office? Couldn't I visit you somewhere else? And I'm thinking, wow. And right on my feet, I thought, I I think I could make that happen. You're going to have to give me a little time. How much yeah. time? 
did you think you wanted? And she just said, well, you know, in the next weeks or a month, it would be lovely if I could plan on seeing you. And so that's what happened. Within a month, I'd sublet an office and I'd started a private practice. That's so cool. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah. It, and, it, 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 yeah. Yeah, I feel so it, it, it brings me a warmth is why I'm smiling about it because um, I hadn't even thought seriously about doing that until yeah. the opportunity came. And it makes me wonder why on earth I would do that until I realized that it wasn't a bizarre opportunity. It was almost inherent. And because it showed up, I took the opportunity. And that's, that's been a huge part of where I am today. Um, so it wasn't like I was trying to make it happen, but I was certainly open yeah. to new experience. And I think when I, when I go back to what's helped me through some of the most difficult things is that I am pretty open to new experience. I'm, right. I really am, and I probably always have been. And, and that's when you talk about resilience, there's an element of our, our temperament or our biology about being open and having a, a wanderlust, so to speak. Uh, just, and it's not, yeah, I call it a restlessness. So I think that was a little bit about what's part of um, people who are resilient. They are open. And, that's how, yeah, this door kept opening for me. Well, you might be more inclined to frame uh, adversity as an opportunity, you know, because of your perspective of being open to new things. You know, you have a comfort level, a comfort level. I'm not saying you, you know, you're, you're over here on the spectrum, but you, relative to others, you have a, a certain comfort level with risk, new experience, right? And so when things are grim, you know, you don't tend to cling to safety and security like some might, right? And so that, that ability to move through mm -hmm. difficulty might be um, a little easier. And, and I don't mean easy, like it's not easy, it's never easy, but you might be just more inclined. I think that's the case, yeah, and I agree with you. It isn't easier, it's more inclined. It's kind of like um, some people are more inclined to be athletic. Yeah and by, by nature in that way. So there's a piece of that in me that I am grateful for. Yes. I, that, that didn't come, or that wasn't developed, that, that I know is part of my, my being. It yes. was, it's part of my family. Isn't that interesting, you know, because there are things that you were just born with. Yes. You know, and certainly the environment would have, you know, given the opportunity for you to develop them, but man, you were born with it. You are. And I and feel I that do, way too. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that just helps us understand when you say somebody's more inclined, um, there's a better propensity for someone to sort of step forward in a different way than somebody who by nature is not open to new experience right. or is way more uh, viscerally uh, impacted by worry. Right. And I always think about people that have a higher value on safety and security versus, you know, yeah. someone who has a higher value on freedom and flexibility, you know, versus, you know, in the, in the way that those two people might show up um, with an unexpected experience. And, and I think that's where we look at how, how to that if we look at the development years mm -hmm. and to see what happens if that element of sort of openness is there before severe, tragic mm -hmm. environmental influences come, then the outcome can be a little bit different um, depending on obviously unknown factors. But yes, if you're, if you're prone to being highly aware of that anxiety and not open to new experience, it is difficult to adapt mm -hmm. or you you use the word risk um i didn't experience it as risk mm -hmm. it's an interesting word for me and i've been asked people say that about uh, taking on uh, private practice leaving a secure job uh taking the risk when it was definitely a question of touch and go financially but they're saying well you took on such a risky thing 
um, I it was I had done my math. I I right. knew I knew I knew the factors that were at play. I mitigated all of that as best I could. But to me, the there was dire concern if I didn't do it. Right. And so I don't see it as risky. I see it as a calculated risk. Yeah. Yeah. And it really is about yeah stepping into ambiguity with, yeah. with good the best calculations and and the word risk is one of those that are is again easily applied because it, it's it's a personal experience for people but um, yeah yeah it was just as scary for me not to do it yes like many of the things as to do it and um and when i first started private practice again uh, that wasn't scary compared to taking a position where I found out I might not be welcome, but definitely wasn't. No, th no, that was like, that was a walk in the park to go and do that because I didn't have to give up my safe base of a job. I could just do this on the side. Right. And I would imagine for someone like yourself, who it sounds like to me, you, you enjoy being on a learning curve. You know, you have a curious mind. That's that and, openness. That's yes. part of that openness. And I really am absolutely. Uh, I lifelong learning. Right. So the thought of being in a position in which your strengths are not being used is deadening, you know, like soul killing, I would think. And so, yeah, yeah a career, a career in a position like that is not worth safe, the safety and security um, and the known. So it would be worth to step out into the unknown a little bit. Um, and so tell us about, so your, your business has then morphed from, you know, I, I rented a space and, and did some one-on-one -on -one counseling with one person to what it is now. So where are you now? You, you are the executive director and clinical director of Inner Solutions, which employs psychologists. We, yes, psychologists and uh, clinical social workers. And I can say we have nine wonderful full-time staff. Yes. And we have uh, full-time administration staff, and we have uh, two contracted psychologists to do just assessments. They don't do clinical counseling, but they do the assessments that families want for their children. And they do the assessments adults may want around um, dementia. Mm -hmm. their memory. I've got uh, someone who's at a career change over the age of 50 and in spite of a, a successful career and academic accomplishments has a question about why they don't uh, adapt or why they don't learn as well in this environment of online and tests. Anyway, those assessments can be done. So we're just happy to say we have this band of clinicians that do work from the dialectical behavior therapy model, which is something that I, a good fortune came on me. My original model of therapy was CBT and working with complicated people, which always appealed to me. Mm -hmm. I found the model that worked even better for complicated symptoms and chronic problems, which is dialectical behavior therapy. And just that just, just again, learning and attending and going down to the States for every education opportunity I could for 14 years and then teaching everybody I could up here, which was something they mandated me with at the time, yeah. is share, share the word. And that just took on its own and, and then with a need, it was a need. People just kept asking, how can I get this with, because we can't get it over here. Well, again, I'll just open the door to that and expand. And, and uh, that is an ongoing process of, again, where's the need? How can I help meet it? Mm -hmm. So that's really, that's really what I do. But I, I carry this, um, you know, management role, but my heart and passion is not in management. My heart and passion is doing the clinical work. And that's my struggle is how much do I devote to my own clinical work interests and how much do I need to devote to the fact I've got a team around me and once you have a team you've got a big system mm -hmm. and it takes time to manage so that's that's where I am now but uh, uh, this has evolved I think just simply being open to what might help and it it seems to have been helpful to a lot of people yeah it's helpful to a lot of people you've you've certainly changed my family 
which I very much appreciate and, and continue to do so. So with, with you, you and I have talked before about dialectic behavioral therapy and what's offered in the public system versus, versus what your organization offers. And um, the way that I've explained it to other people is that there, what you can, dialectic behavioral therapy is not easy or cheap to deliver. To, to deliver it in the way that it was meant to be delivered, and it was created, I think, by Marsha Linehan, right? And, yes. and, and the idea here is that it's meant to be delivered almost um, in the moment, like you need some in the moment coaching, you know, for people on, on using the skills when they're in deregulating for, you know, and this, this then requires a service model that the public system isn't set up to deliver. And so what we see when people talk about dialectic, people say, well, I've done dialectic behavioral therapy. Well, where did you do it? And they'll say, well, I did it, you know, through HS, HS. And, and what then I, I, I get into is usually they have a dialectic behavioral therapy informed therapy really not so they, they've used some skills or they've taught some skills but they've not really delivered dbt the way that it was yes. set up to be delivered so uh, tell me about your passion for that kind of delivery model well that the model is designed to treat the fact the problems are chronic mm. meaning they are there and they won't 100% ever go away. The problems are known to be related to emotionality, who we are as people. So it is an expensive model only because any long-term treatment for anything is going to be expensive when you have professionals delivering it. So it's not an expensive model other than it's a long-term model. It's no more expensive than any other therapy if you only did a piece or if you only did 10, visits with somebody it's the exact same the fact is so long term so in that sense it's designed to treat complicated overlapping multi-diagnostic issues and with that you need people who know the model and that have a heart for people and in my time i've learned that the technical you can you can have a very solid academic foundation and you can learn the the manual and write the exam but the understanding of dbt is about relationship mm -hmm. and through relationship people change mm -hmm. and within that relationship they need to be taught informed and guided to produce and that's that very very special piece of dbt that's what isn't often something people can commit to mm -hmm. as clinicians because yes. long-term therapy with complicated clients that are not delivered within a very uh, supportive professional environment is dangerous long it's you you don't do effective therapy you may even do bad therapy but you might even for all the right reasons end up getting burned out and mm -hmm. who suffers you both suffer the client suffers you suffer so the therapy is something that has to be delivered long term a minimum of one year is what they ask and then the therapist has to be guided to do it now the science behind it is simple mm -hmm. Marsha Linehan put together something like 85 skills. This is not brand new invention. She just started selecting, okay, that works, that doesn't work. And it was kind of like a sorting process. Mm -hmm. And then she lined it all up. And with that, educating people that are in a high state of emotion becomes a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. Adult education when you're in a high state of emotional distress. So the process again has to be in two parts, that individual relationship mm -hmm. and then teaching somebody in a manner they learn. And what we have found is that the recommended protocol is 24 weeks, two and a half hours of a psychoeducation skills class mm -hmm. concurrent with weekly individual therapy mm -hmm. is essentially six or seven months. So mm -hmm. that is time consuming, but that's the foundation. Mm -hmm. After that, people will integrate practice you know you know they ride they fall off their bike they start again and they yes. do this until there we go we've got it they can teach it themselves that's our 
or idea, but the team has to have a sense of that relationship commitment. Yes. They have to have that um, heart for complicated people. Yes. They, they have to have their own kind of resiliency around this. And as a, as a therapist, if you don't have a permanent team committed to this, then you're asking too much of staff. And mm -hmm. if you don't give them the training, so DBT training for a clinician is really two years on top of their master's degree. Commitment. And that, and that's commitment. That's internship. Yeah. So they, but they can't do it without actually starting with clients right away. So right. you start with clients and good supervision and monitoring. And then over two years, a year, two years, a year, you know, this stuff, but two years in, you finally figured out it's kind of like a swim coach. You can, you've got some subtleties that you can help each student learn how to do a certain swimming maneuvers. So that's what we do. And that's why I think we have something very, very special yeah. that isn't available. Usually through publicly funded programs, they find it so difficult to, um, you get long term, long seniority staff, 20, 25 years, but they haven't been carrying clients. Some of our clients are there for a year. Some of our clients have been there seven years. Why would that be? because they got well and then life happened mm -hmm. and they stayed to sort of stay the current so they're not there seven years every day a week with no, therapy or not. something my goodness no but this is really why we can offer something different that the that the public health system is really cramped to offer they can't really offer that long-term consistent relationship with no they can't, uh, you know, having worked in that system, I, I've seen, I've, I've seen that. We're just not set up to do that. I mean, the public system changes every four years with the government now, especially very political, you know, as a, as an, a provincial service. So um, when you talk about this relationship commitment, and that's, that's one of the components that I see that is not, that's not deliverable in the public system, because, you know, I know that even for, for my daughter, you know, she's able to text uh, in the moment, in the yep. evenings, or, you know, at school, oh. or wherever she's experiencing oh. an issue, she can, she has access to her therapist that can help her, remind her, to coach her, to, to, you know, to use the skills or even can suggest a skill that she knows that she knows, she knows, but she just needs, she needs some guidance, support, some validation, some, so someone so who knows they, her. Thanks for bringing that back. It, that part is what really makes DBT delivery yeah. exceptional. And many, many programs, be it our public health system in Canada or the States, Mm -hmm. Those systems just can't pay their unionized staff to they be can't. on call. So DBT, part of the protocol is that the therapist is in a real relationship and that is available mm -hmm. more than at the one hour weekly appointment. So the person is supposed to reach out and ask for coaching. Mm -hmm. And many people understand what life coaching is about or what, you know, sports coaching is about. This is about helping somebody take the intellectual and use it when they're in a high state of emotion mm -hmm. and coach them literally before they're in the crisis. And those coaching interventions are what put this into real time mm -hmm. and help a person integrate in the moments. And this expedites. So when you think about long-term therapy or why the, the expense around this, think about what would happen if somebody had to learn this stuff, take home an idea, take home homework, take home a concept that they were really focused on, get home, life happens, and now they're supposed to remember it on a, you know, four days later in the evening at the crux of the moment. Well, that is why DBT says, no, no, call for coaching. We don't want you to try and go back to old habits and then come back to session and have to do a chain analysis on what you would have, could have, should have done. Here's how I failed. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. That, that's where it's a big commitment. When you think about a DBT therapist, lots of people know the skills, so they think they talk DBT. No, no, mm -hmm. the therapist is the therapy and that individual relationship. And we then, we simply just let people wean off and come right. back whenever they want. And that's the other beautiful thing about what we can offer that, again, the system can't, the public system can't offer. They've got wait lists upon wait lists. Exactly. And, and the urgency uh, that comes from that, you just they haven't got enough. No, and when someone's not feeling well or feeling rather unwell, and they, like it takes so much energy to advocate for yourself from that position. And so, you know, I know that for, for Allie, when, you know, when she says, you know, I, I think I need some help, I can't say, well, you just need to wait three to six months for that help, you know, because first of all, like, where does that leave you? And, okay. and, and also, you know, the window closes when people are willing mm -hmm. to make that effort, you gotta take them right where they are, you know? Uh, and that's what we try to do. So we have yeah. no wait list, even yes. when, I mean, we will stretch our own limits and boundaries because things ebb and flow in life. Yes. And so, you know, we'll take on people in that way because we know there'll be a quieter time coming. Uh, or as management, then obviously I'm looking for more staff or some yeah. other programming shift. But this, the key to this kind of therapy we do and that I really it's very, very hard to think about the commitment to be made and that our public system can offer that to the numbers of people that need this long term. Yeah. You know, the public system treats chronic long term conditions, but they don't treat it with one nope. sustainable model that has research to support that the outcome is very good if you deliver it over time. They just don't have that. They're trying to do the best they can by offering pieces, uh, you know, pieces that, you know, out of the four part DBT components, they just offer a piece here and there. And, and that probably does no harm. It disappoints some ther the clients who say, I've had it and it didn't work well. Well, yeah. You had, that, that, you had it and you didn't get to integrate it. Yes, and I run into the same sort of discussion when we talk about EMDR therapy, you know, people, because it's not a regulated thing, yeah. you know, people yeah. can say that they've done, D I, I, I talk to people all the time, I say, have you done EMDR? Well, yeah, I did, and it didn't work. Well, what happened? Well, that was not EMDR the way, it was, that was a little bit of eye movement, that was not EMDR, you know, and so, you know, I, I so trying to help people become responsible consumers, yeah. you know, of their own health care can be tricky as well when it, when things aren't quite regulated, you know, how we use these the therapy models. So um, I want to just, there's two more things I want to talk about. How much time have we got here? Oh, it's 12.05. Are you okay? Let's go till quarter after. Okay. So one thing I wanted to just quickly mention is that from a mom's perspective, you know, we talk about that ability for a patient to be able to, to access mm -hmm. a therapist. What that did for me in my home was uh, it took me from being the case manager slash mm -hmm. on-call counselor, which I'm not. Uh, but that was the position that I was in because I did have, you know, kids who saw a psychiatrist once a week or once a month or whatever it was at the time. And then they became deregulated or hopeless or suicidal at 11 a.m., you know, on Saturday. <laughs> and, and, and there I am trying to give them a pep talk, which is not what they need. But that's what I would, you know, you're like, oh my God, and you know, your, your life's interrupted and every year become unregulated. And, it was a mess until, and then I finally, I was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, when Allie started with DBT, I could say to her, well, have you texted your therapist? And then I could just walk away. It was such a relief. It was such a, an eye opener that I am not their solution. I, I, I'm not meant to be their solution. I am their mother. That's a very different thing. You know, and that even though while I might be coaching, counseling, I, I don't counsel. I, I don't, I'm, I'm very careful about that. I coach, I consult uh, to people. And um, I, I was a nurse, you know, and so I'm offering therapeutic ears to people. 
I'm not meant to be doing that with my own kids. No mother really is. I'm their mom. Yeah. That's it. And, and that's, that's so important to remember. Yeah. And that was a tough, it was a relief. It was a tough one to learn. And it was a relief. It was a relief. So there, that's one of the things that um, finding um, your services did for us, you know, just really helped us out so much. And then um, I, I remember I wanted to highlight this too. I remember calling you one day years ago, it's a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, a little bit confused and a little bit distressed, low grade distress, I would say, that I had come across, I'd, I'd had a conversation with someone who was arguing that borderline personality was not a real diagnosis, that it was, um, in her, in her view, a very normal reaction to very abnormal situations. And this came from the population that she worked with at the time, which was primarily, she was doing research with women who, severely abused women. And so she, she came, was coming at this from the perspective that this is a label that's destructive and detrimental and actually becomes a barrier to accessing services. And, I, and the next call I made was to a psychologist in town who teaches social work. And he said the same thing and he quoted, he started quoting research to me. And then I would say, well, what you're, you know, about, about the, the cause of borderline personality was a separation issue, typically with the mother, you know, and, and, you know, this, you know, and I, and I look in the DSM and there is the allusion to this, that there, this is a, an abnormal, I don't want to say, what is it? Abnormal, I should have this in front of me. Like yeah, a separa sure. separation anxiety, not, not that, but anyway, something like that yeah. in, in the relate, you know, a maladaptive separation issue. And, and that he, and like I say, he quoted research to me that, and I would ask what year was that? And he would quote, you know, like 80 years old. And I think this is yeah. unacceptable. And then I called you and I'm like, Donna, is this, is this a thing? Like there's this bias that I'm coming across mm -hmm. in the professional community mm -hmm. around borderline personality. What's going on out there? You know, cause I found the diagnosis a relief because it led us to the right therapy. And it, it, it helped me give, it gives some context and some, some empathy to what my kids were experiencing. Mm -hmm. So what's going on out there? And you were, you were so articulate about all this. Can you share? You may not remember the conversation, but. I, I, I often get the opportunity to, to speak to this because we know what, we know so much more than we did 30 years ago. Mm. And I think that's what's important here is to understand that 30 years in the context of psychiatry mental health is a relatively short time. It's way, it's a lifetime, it's a generation uh, for us. But what we know now is still becoming clarified and known. This diagnosis is very controversial to this day. It's very hard to diagnose. And the Knowing we have from 1993 textbook, a 27 year old textbook that is still relevant today. It is still a seminal understanding of borderline disorder and this is very, very important. So the key we know there is that the original uh, examination of borderline disorder did prove that 70 some percent of the women in outpatient mental health programs had a sexual abuse history. Mm -hmm. This is important to know. That's what we found when we first started towards ago. So what we now know, which was also in that textbook, that there's a huge biological element to this, mm -hmm. which is true. Some people are highly reactive from birth some people are not as reactive. This is part of that biological sense of reactivity and therefore resilience. We now know that is a factor because there are many, many people that have had sexual abuse experiences of their different levels that didn't end up suicidal in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what we now look at is which part of BPD is biological and which part has been the impact of the environment and highly sensitive people may have had an ordinary environment and they experienced bigger than normal reactions that didn't dissipate well and left layers of problems. But other people for sure have had trauma. So we need to, and we have over the years, become very much clearer about which part is playing which part, how much of this is biology, how much of this is the external environment. And that helps guide how we treat it and in what order we treat. So part of a good DBT treatment protocol is that preliminary assessment, getting the big picture, understanding a person's strengths, their weaknesses, what's going to be there for the rest of their life and what's going to be part of their history. So that's what we do, we do well. So mm -hmm. It's really important that originally when we talked about borderline disorder, it wasn't well received because it was judged to be people that were looking for attention. Mm -hmm. They were, but it faded quickly when they got that attention. So it confused the healthcare providers, but mostly because there wasn't a good treatment protocol. And it's really, really hard to tell somebody they have cancer, but we can't treat you, or they have this one, this amazing new diagnosis, but nobody knows how to treat it. So, you know, we'll just wish you the best. Mm -hmm. So that was true up until 20 years ago in Calgary. And mm -hmm. then it's, it's become better, which is why I think people are more open to saying, okay, this is a treatable phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the other is, this is a diagnosis. And that's mm -hmm. what's so important. It's not a label. If it can be, because you're absolutely right with the unknowing people or the bias that people have, especially within family units where they have an untreated symptoms. Yes. But there, there's many other labels that go hand in hand, like addiction. <clears throat> yeah. And again, if we can understand the diagnosis, then we can go to what are the steps forward to treat the symptoms and how do we plan the future and have the prognosis bent on that. That's what we can do and do better when it comes to this diagnosis. So that's the question. What is it? Is there a treatment protocol? What is that? Can we give you all or part of the treatment protocol? And if we don't want to diagnose it, why not? And that would be the question. Why wouldn't you want to diagnose this? At least if you visit the diagnosis, you can say you actually only have three out of nine instead of nine out of nine. Yes. This is so important for clarity. Anybody in our program uh, that gets or wants a diagnosis, we get most of the people coming in wanting a diagnosis or being relieved. Oh yes. my goodness, I know what it is. The people that don't want diagnosis are afraid of being judged and shamed and maybe punished or ostracized for it. Absolutely, those are valid reasons to not want to have a diagnosis, aka label. That the label's not, you know, and so to say, is it the same? Well, kind of, I guess, out, out there in the, in the real world, the ordinary world, the vernacular, what's the difference? Well, it's only different if you know what it's treatable and then where can you get treatment? And that's the most frustrating thing still, that's still not enough long-term pure dbt treatment available mm -hmm. because that's what's needed for the most complicated person with borderline and dbt treats trauma now in a way that we didn't talk about it very well 20 years ago mm -hmm. but stage two explicit trauma treatment and depending on what kind of trauma when that trauma occurred we can discern how much of it there's different trauma protocols now, EMDR being one of them, that is going to treat something different than something from, say, complex relational trauma from childhood abandonment. Right. right. There you a, go. It's the abandonment issue. That's the abandonment. And when a child was neglected or abandoned, that trauma is resolved differently than it would be if there was an incident of sexual abuse, et cetera. So that's what we are very good at discerning now. That's cool. And when you say abandoned, they don't maybe felt abandoned? Well, this is back to 
resiliency when when you've been on your own and needy and you had a sense there's a way of getting your needs met somewhere somehow or in time is different than if you're on your own and helpless to meet your own needs Got it. ever this leaves a different experience inside yep. Yep. and someone with borderline disorder highly emotional they're in a high level of despair and fear and they may not get those needs met so the very idea of being on your own is terrifying Got it. You learn, and for some people they learn they're helpless to help themselves except through ensuring they never ever end up on their own so Got it. so there's your your perceived manipulative behaviors right all they're meeting their needs they're trying now yeah. abandonment is still in the dsm yes i see and it. and it the, they say the dsm-5 took longer to come out because of all of the difficulties around personality disorders interesting abandonment was first used in the old psychiatric understanding of borderline disorder from the 1930s so it well that's where i was trying to go with the motherhood thing yeah the that's right. yeah. issues. And, um, and so when you talk about three out of nine or nine out of nine you're talking about um the criteria. clinical criteria right mm -hmm. so so because i remember ali at the age of 14 15 um was not allowed to be diagnosed because her personality hadn't been fully formed and yet you know evidence says that the earlier you get treatment the better the outcome and this is the frustration that i've spoken to other mothers about so you know we can't get a diagnosis or or someone's refusing to give a diagnosis because of bias yeah. and 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 that then becomes a barrier to getting effective treatment at a time when it would be the most effective so i'm really grateful to the psychiatrist that sort of pushed that dsm across the table to ali and said have a look at this list you know anything resonate for you and she said yeah you know and four out of the nine you know spoke to her and so the psychiatrist then turned to me and said she doesn't have a diagnosis but she's certainly meeting the clinical criteria for this here's the gold standard of treatment there you thank go. you thank you and that's what's happened since we have treatment and more people are willing to understand is treatable right. and that's where when we didn't have treatment and it wasn't considered treatable because we didn't have treatment that why would you diagnose it yeah so that's the most important thing and you know that's the myth that many many families have had is that you know it was in the dsm4 that adolescents can be diagnosed oh, okay they took it out it's always been there it, but why, is it, why isn't it is it is in the dsm-5 as well then oh yeah or they, they didn't take that out no they it's never been out it's been in but they've ignored it they refuse wow. they want to play to the hope and the idea this is an adolescent adjustment reaction etc and all of that may be true but that's because they didn't understand the vulnerability that emotional undercurrent of vulnerability that isn't going to be something that they get over with adolescence. It was there, then adolescence happened, and then it will be there be, uh, down the road. And it's really about understanding, I like to use the most simple uh, analogy is that some of us sunburn very easily. And some of us don't have that peaches and cream. And what's the difference? How come some of these white skinned Caucasian people that sunburn or don't sunburn, what's the difference? Well, it's just the way you are and you'll either take a look at that and use sunscreen or you'll get into some very interesting ways to prove that you can toughen that skin and not get the long-term effects of those uvb rays you know i'm going what the heck do we do so no it's really about not shaming it's a treatment and somebody understand how they are who they are and living well within that and modifying all they have to do and and that looks like resilience um and it, it aids resilience to have somebody know and teach and coach you to do yeah. these things it aids and over time it, what's amazing because i've had the privilege of working with the same client over a decade and more not every week, as I want to really make clear, but I got to know them when they're 19 and I see them at 34. 
Yeah. And they come back going, okay, I just want to touch base because I'm doing all of this and I'm not sure how it's going to play. For sure. That's called resilience. Um, yes. you, don't, you don't have to, uh, you know, you just deal with life's issues more effectively. That's resilience. Anyway. And when people are so, you know, have such a bias towards the diagnosis and call it a label, I wonder who in their lives have they come across who was untreated? Because that's where it's exactly. usually coming from. Oh, absolutely. It, it, you know, that. Yeah. So you know an untreated borderline yeah. that has been difficult to have a relationship with, and that is your then impression, which I understand, of, of that diagnosis and what that kind of person's like. And I'm, I'm so fortunate to be able to say, with my own two kids, they don't present that way at all. Yeah. And I'm so grateful and, and, and to you and to your, to your group and the work that you do. For, for that. So thank you for that. Well, and thank you for the conversation. It's been my, very, it's very my good. pleasure. My pleasure and my passion. And all I can say is that there's a fantastic team around me and we're, mm. a, we've got, um, the, the date hasn't been given, but the application's in for full certification from the American Standards Board for a DBT nice. program. Nice. Uh, no. Congratulations. Just, That's awesome. Anyway, thank you, Maureen, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Donna. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. Hello, friends. Thanks for listening. I am your host, Maureen Towns, and I am the founder of Maureen Towns Consulting. We support families who are experiencing uh, disruptive mental health and addictions issues go from chaos to calm. If you enjoyed this podcast, please listen, share, and subscribe. And please also know that um, you can reach me at maureentowns.com and you can reach out to me uh, through the website and uh, I'm happy to chat with anybody. Um, my work, the work that I do, is based on my 25 years working as a nurse in both the public and the private healthcare systems in Canada, as well as my facilitation and my education and my training in leadership development, as well as my experience with my own families and supporting them, both all the successes and all the struggles with uh, mental health and addictions issues. And you can read all about those issues in my upcoming book, should be released this year, please, please, uh, should be released this year, and the book is called Broken Open, so keep your eyes peeled for that and any information on that. Again, thanks for listening. Please don't forget to share and subscribe.